past NATA president and director uh, at OSER. Um, a few housekeeping things. Um, there are questions that you can post in the chat area on, uh, on the GoToMeeting uh, uh, space, and we'll address those questions um, at the end. Also, your certificates of attendance will be sent and emailed to you to submit to the BOC for the category one, uh, category D one credit. So you have to submit that to the BOC, but the certificates will be emailed to you uh, tomorrow, um, in uh, tomorrow morning. So before I introduce our um, esteemed speaker, I have, uh, I wanna um, introduce three really special athletic trainers who are with us tonight um, sharing their expertise and discussion. Um, this webinar was focused on the athletic trainers practicing in the armed services and public safety. Um, because we really feel we as OSER want to um, put a spotlight on those athletic trainers and, and be of help to them in solving their problems, finding solutions and, and helping with patient outcomes. Of course, there are other athletic trainers on the webinar also. But the three athletic trainers that I would like to introduce to you are um, key leaders and pioneers in these particular practice settings. Terry DeWitt is a retired colonel from the Army Reserves and Chair of Kinesiology at Wachita Baptist University. In the early 2000s, he saw a need to provide athletic training services to our military and to unite and represent athletic trainers practicing in the military. The Armed Forces Athletic Trainer Society was the result. Terry continues to be an ambassador for athletic trainers practicing in the armed forces. He was deployed twice in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and was awarded two bronze stars. Uh, Don Kessler, I've known these people my whole career and we're close friends and it's just so great to have them on the call tonight. I first knew Don when he was a head athletic trainer at Rutgers University and we worked together on several NATA initiatives together. Don is the athletic training trainer for basic underwater demolition SEAL training at the Naval Special Warfare Center in Coronado, overseeing SEAL candidates in training. He and our speaker tonight, Dr. Provincher, have worked closely together for many years, uh, together setting up the Special Forces Tactical Athlete Program, a comprehensive wellness injury prevention and rehab program for Naval Special Services. If you follow Don on Facebook, this guy is the most fit person you have ever met and he doesn't stop. So um, yeah. in, your, in your careers, get to know Don Kessler and it will improve your longevity, I guarantee it. <laughs> Nancy Burke, uh, NATA Hall of Famer. Nancy started her career as a teacher athletic trainer in Reston, Virginia. She was there for 29 years and retired, only to start another full-time career. There were always members of the police force at her high school events, and they were always asking her about musculoskeletal <laughs> conditions and, and how do I help, how do I solve this, how do I solve that? Give me your advice as an athletic trainer. She quickly realized the need to provide athletic training services to this population and developed a comprehensive prevention and rehab program for the police department which expanded throughout Fairfax County and to other safety employees and other municipalities throughout the country. In 2009, she formed the Public Safety Athletic Trainer Society. She is nationally known as the definitive expert in this area. These are three people you need to meet, you need to get to know, and as athletic trainers, you know we share our knowledge with, you, with each other and they would love to hear from you. They'll be discussing some of the questions and adding some things throughout the evening. And now to our uh, stellar speaker, the main stage. Captain Matthew Provincher graduated with distinction from the United States Naval Academy. He completed his medical education at Dartmouth Medical School, his orthopedic residency at the Naval Medical Center, and his sports medicine fellowship at Rush Medical Center in Chicago. He is internationally recognized for his research and publications and is a sought after speaker throughout the world. Captain Provincher served as an orthopedic surgeon at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego from 2007 to 2013. He was the head orthopedic team physician for the Navy SEAL teams one, three, five, 
and seven. He's performed extensive humanitarian work, including serving as the director for surgical services for four years on the USNS Mercy. And I think in the COVID era, um, we saw the mercy and comfort on our televisions a lot. And that puts, in pers puts into perspective uh, the service, humanitarian service that Dr. Provincher provided during his past. In 2012, Dr. Provincher became chief of sports surgery at Mass General Hospital and medical <clears throat> director and head team physician for the New England Patriots. He was medical director during their 2014 Super Bowl championship season. He joined the prestigious Stedman Clinic and Stedman Philippon Research Institute in 2016, where he continues his commitment to research and patient care. He continues his duties in the Navy as a reservist and is assigned to Navy SEAL Team 17 in Coronado. No one epitomizes the term team physician more than Dr. Provincher. He has been an advocate for athletic trainers throughout his career, and we're honored to have him as our presenter this evening. Dr. Provincher. Marge, uh, I mean, <clears throat> truly incredible and humbling. Uh, certainly did not need uh, about 90% of that. It's it's really, uh, really for me, it's been an honor and just an incredible journey, but really it's about the team that's around us and around all of you and surrounding us on this talk tonight. And it starts with you, Marge. I wanna thank you, uh, the team for OSER. We can't make incredible education events like this happen without uh, your support and OSER support. And Marge, I, I know you singled out three, but I'm gonna single out you as, you know, former president of the Athletic Training Society and just an incredible uh, human being that's really helped uh, our musculoskeletal care for our patients evolve over the last 20 to 30 years. And I really appreciate you for that and also your work with OSER. It goes hand in hand. Uh, Colonel DeWitt, Don Kessler, Nancy Burke, thank you for all your service. And also thank you, uh, the athletic trainers and everyone else who's had the opportunity to join us on the uh, call this evening. I, I got to tell you, I've learned more from you and y'all in the training room than many of my orthopedic mentors in surgery. Yeah, surgery is important, but this, this is even more so because I, I truly believe it's about 20 to 30 percent on the technical, the surgical, the, that type of side. And Really, it's 60 to 70 percent everything else, and that's why this is so important. I'm going to talk about some cases tonight that were in and out of the military, and some folks that uh, you know we tried to help get back to duty, and some concepts uh, that we've continued to wrestle with and, and provide some updates. So, again, thank you for joining uh, me this evening, and uh, everyone at uh, everyone on the call. These are my disclosures, and I would encourage you to look those up in the AAOS. Uh, specifically, I receive uh, royalties from Arthrex and a consultant for Arthrex, the Joint Restoration Foundation, which is now a graft company, and Slack, uh, which is a publishing company. I serve on multiple editorial boards, board membership, and we also have numerous institutional disclosures here as well. When I was in the military, Marge uh, mentioned the DSS on the USS Mercy, uh, USNS Mercy, sorry, it's a naval. United States uh, Naval Hospital ship, uh, TAH-19. Uh, I was on that for about seven years. Probably the best parking spot I'll ever have. Now, we never really had good parking at Balboa at San Diego where I was stationed for about 17 years. I'm not sure if you can see it. I slicked the hair back just a little bit, but uh, my retirement papers were submitted in the spring. And uh, this is probably the longest my hair has been since age 18 when I showed up at the Naval Academy. So. Uh, after 27 to 28 years, we'll have to see how the final calculation comes at, uh, out. Uh, we'll be retiring at, at some point this year and uh, hopefully with a good retirement celebration at some point. Celebrating with this guy is always fun when you have a, but that's also part of a great medical team behind you, which starts with our athletic trainers, therapists, strength, conditioning, nutrition, everyone else. And if I can just remind you, you know, this is always a great time. There's Jim Whalen on the left there uh, with Robert and Jonathan Kraft, the owners of the Patriots on the right. But Jim Whalen on the left, the head ATC for the Patriots for, oh boy, going on 15, 16 years now. And you got to advocate and take care of your people. And one of the things I was particularly proud of was getting uh, rings for people uh, and titles that hadn't gotten them after winning the Super Bowl. But I had to beat up the crafts quite a bit to be able to do that. We had to justify it. But at the end of the day, we were able to increase by uh, more than 200% the amount of rings given to the medical staff. You have to take care of your people. And these are the best partners you'll ever have. Uh, some of the folks that I practice with in San Diego and um, 
Captain Dana Kobe, one of the most decorated physicians in all of Navy and probably Army as well as Air Force, uh, just an incredible leader and humanitarian and deployed more than 14 times uh, to harm's way and helped take care of our folks. This is back in 2012 when the Mercy was leaving. Uh, one of my kids didn't want to leave, see me leave for seven months, but I, I do want to know that I do want to acknowledge all those out there that have served, whether it's in uh, public health, uh, public safety, uh, the military, uh, working for civilian agencies. There's a lot of sacrifice for people that work with the government or other outside non-government organizations that are affiliated with the government. And it, it's hard. It's hard to go away for seven months. And it's particularly hard on those you leave behind. So I want to thank everyone for that. So with that, I want to get into our, our first case. I have a few cases. And I really want to, I didn't want to pound through a lot of cases. I really wanted to dive in a little bit deeper so we could have more of uh, some time to talk about some of the current issues and where we are with certain things like shoulder instability and ACL. So this is a 23-year-old male, a Navy diver, special operations, played football, soccer in college, very active, multi-sport, which we like, and that's a whole other discussion, but early sports specialization, that's a big problem we have, and when you have the 11-year-old playing soccer year-round, that's a problem. So we need to fix that, um, and it's incumbent upon us to do that better as a musculoskeletal team. So he had initial dislocation, a dis dislocation, subluxation, and that didn't have to have it reduced. Uh, he dislocated while attacking someone going after him. A uh, very well-trained athletic trainer relocated it on the sideline and was able to return to play in three weeks. Uh, being at the Naval Academy, I always uh, like to see us out running coverage. Uh, certainly Air Force and Army is our uh, big competition on the football field, but we're all one team uh, when we're representing the United States. So case one continued, presents in the training room. The athletic trainer is there side by side, which is always fantastic. You've already talked about the patient. You've already got good history. And then you go talk to the patient together, which I love. And he learned so much. But had a positive apprehension, positive relocation, positive surprise. We'll go over a few of these. Had good scapular control. All exams start uh, with shirt off or for females, an appropriate garment. So you can look at the scapula, half look at the scapula from the back. There could be some things you pick up many times, serratus anterior, low trapezius, rhomboid, scapular winging. It's a huge problem. That's got to be fixed uh, potentially before surgery, but also recognized so you can deal with it after surgery. Um, we had a bank heart tear on the imaging and used a celly brace around the arm. I put a question there, does this work? Well, you actually look at some of the evidence, it actually does work reasonably well, uh, especially if you have a padded sport where you can tie it, uh, where you can tie it into the pads. So I think there's some uh, evidence to help support the shoulder not coming out of joint. And why do we not want that shoulder coming out of joint? Well, as healthcare professionals, we want to try to keep that shoulder in joint. And there's a reason we're doing braces, a reason we're hassling, whether a reason you're telling your athlete, even though they may hate wearing it, yeah, if you want to play, we want to keep that shoulder from coming out of joint. And so use that brace and use that appropriately. Try to convince them. Try to make it uh, palatable. Use all your athletic training tricks to make it make it all palatable and as good as possible. But the pro there's a cost to recurrent instability. And so every time that shoulder subluxes or comes out, it's well documented. You get more labral tears, larger heel sacs, and you get more bone loss. And these are bigger problems and bigger issues when we're dealing with instability. What else do we get? Well, that's not all. We get capsular injuries. We get more GLAD lesions. GLAD is glenoid labrum articular disruption. You can see the cartilage injury there. You get more cartilage injuries. That leads to early arthritis, alpsa tears, anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion, alphabet soup, a shoulder here, but you just know that you have these other issues that come up and they also uh, beckon a higher risk of failure. You also get more Hill Sachs injuries. And here you have these on and off track lesions or looking at how the bone integrates and assimilates with the glenoid and the Hill Sachs. And so this is, this is why we want to try to prevent a recurrence. So if I can get an athlete and say, listen, if you have time and we can do this now and we can do this first, there's plenty of very good evidence that we can avoid a lot of these sequelae if we operate early, especially with a known instability event, especially in a high-risk population, contact athlete under age 25, male or female, probably doesn't matter. It's, it's just a problem. So we have to be a little bit smarter about it. And I'm just going to go through some of the evidence. We know there's more labral tears. If you had, uh, if you had more recurrence, you had more labral tears. It was shown on MRI. It was shown with more bone loss. And if you had uh, bank heart lesions, more than 86% of those had larger uh, labral tears at the end of the day. 
<clears throat> what happens when you have one instability event? Well, you get bipolar lesions, meaning you get an injury both on the glenoid and the humerus. But guess what? Recurrence, meaning more than one, recurrence is just more than one, it doubles. Now you have bipolar lesions, bone loss, and you've potentially did, dealing with a different situation. So again, liking to get after this first, I think it's important to have a discussion with uh, your patient about that and also getting the, getting the team circled up and not necessarily just treating an instability event or dislocation as, okay, get back, get back, get back. I think it's worthwhile to have that discussion uh, and give the athletes some options. You do get more glenoid bone loss. And so here's a study looking at intercollegiate American football. This is actually through all the service academies, a great collaboration from West Point Naval Academy and Air Force Academy. If you had recurrence, meaning again, more than one, you had more than 13% bone loss. It's kind of one of our magic numbers we're looking at that you have a higher recurrence rate with arthroscopic stabilization. So another good evidence. Um, Multi-center analysis, when you look at others, um, if you just have a primary injury, less likely to have glenoid bone loss. There's more capsular injuries. Why is a capsule important? Well, the capsule connects the labrum to the humerus. It's very important. We need that capsule to be able to stabilize the shoulder. But as you have recurrence, you get more capsule labral lesions. And if you look at a, uh, a study uh, overseas from South Korea, higher incidence rotator cuff tears and patient recurrent instability. So again, it's not just the capsule labrum, but you're also getting uh, rotator cuff, rotator cuff caps, uh, capsule, et cetera. Um, more cartilage damage, recurrent instability, 73% recurrence, only 10% if you had a primary. That's a lot. And so your joint's changing. Once you get that sheer cartilage damage, I can't replace that. I can't just transplant cartilage to the glenoid very easily. We don't have, we don't have good things for that right now, even in 2020. So more bank heart lesions, big problems. You can sort of see where I'm going from, uh, going with this is you have more instability events, you have more issues in the shoulder. I think it's incumbent upon us to be intelligent to talk with our athletes about this and help them understand it, you know, at least in basic principles, you're gonna have more bone injuries, more cartilage problems, more capsule, more bank heart. Let them make the decision, um, but bring the medical team together. This on and off track, we'll talk about this a little bit. I just mentioned this just so you, you can be conversant about on and off track. Off track is bad. That's when you get a lot of bone loss and a lot of bony injuries and the off track lesion ends up uh, being easier to engage. So the shoulder comes out, it locks out, it stays out there, and then it gets back in. So you get these off-track lesions if you have more instability events. And we like it being on track, meaning, yeah, no matter where you put the shoulder, I can't really get that uh, humerus to engage. And so these are the concepts we're talking about. You don't need to know any of these numbers, way too much math. I'm just telling you some of the some of the things that are going through with this is we're looking at how much glenoid bone loss here. And you can see this is a patient that had recurrent instability and they have glenoid bone loss. And in panel B there, they have a Hill-Sachs lesion. Those interact, they go together. And if you have more glenoid bone loss, it's pretty intuitive that Hill-Sachs becomes more significant. So if you have more bone, an issue, it just becomes more significant. So this is how I like doing my tests. I know there's a ton of ways to do this, but anterior instability, I like I like putting the patient uh, supine. Why? Stabilizes the scapula and really just isolates the glenohumeral joint. I've got my hand directly over the coracoid tip, so you're right on the front of the shoulder, so you're stabilizing it, and you're then able to do multiple push-pull procedures, anterior translation, inferior translation, posterior translation, and you move the arm in, in variety of positions. You don't have to be all the way up here in abduction external rotation. A lot of instability is just in mid-abduction. So about 30, 40 degrees of abduction, and then you test external rotation. And that's a really good test. And you see, you see how they behave, you see if they like it. You can push it back in, and that's a relocation test. Why am I showing you sulcus? Well, because collagen is important. Why is collagen important? Because it makes up the labrum, makes up the capsule, makes up everything in our body. Basically, that's musculoskeletal. Collagen's our friend as a musculoskeletal professional. But if it's loose and a patient has hyperlaxity, sulcus can be a big issue. And we may have to change our procedure based on what we see as a sulcus. So the patient is seated with the arm at the side, inferior force is applied, inferior force applied to the elbow. And you're basically able to see how far that humerus comes down relative to the acromion. And so the bad problem is if you externally rotate the sulcus sign should go away, but if you externally rotate the arm and pull down on it and you get the same amount of inferior translation with both neutral and external rotation, that could be a pathologic sulcus and something we need to look at. And that's what I'm showing right here. I hope these videos are coming through, but you can see the dimpling on this 17-year-old female. 
Her arm is at the side on the left. And then look at her external rotation. She has 95 degrees of external rotation. She's She actually had a variant of Ehlers Danlos syndrome. And uh, she actually underwent a huge uh, open capsular shift and also reconstruction with uh, cadaver tendon because her tissue was just so deficient. Relocation is when you put it back, they feel better. And it's just like when you relocate it on the sideline. This is a classic finding here. I'd love for you to, if you have patients that have recurrence, multiple recurrences, test this out. You can also predict bone loss from history. It takes a two minute history. History of multiple dislocations, history of long time of instability, meaning more than probably three to four months, history of failed stabilization procedures, and then this examination finding, which demonstrates <gasps> significant instability. And he does not like it just in mid abduction. So that's bone loss till proven otherwise. We've redefined this, and uh, my good friend J.T. Tokish in the Air Force and Army colleagues at a Tripler really came up with a very elegant study that looked at a lot of how you did outcomes-wise, and this critical bone loss was about 13.5%. Well, I can tell you, when you're measuring these things on PACs or bringing out the digital ruler on all our x-rays, what is 13.5%? Well, if you go from 5% to 13%, that could only be about a millimeter and a half, 1.5 millimeters. So the other thing here is that glenoid doesn't take a joke. And when you start losing bone, these percentages add up really quickly. Why is that? Even in a uh, large patient, the width of the glenoid is 28, maybe 30, maybe 32 millimeters. And so you can see if you take away three millimeters, 10%, you take away six millimeters, you've got 20% easily. So it adds up really quickly. But, you know, we have, we may have to be careful. We still need to, you're treating the patient first, what they do, who they are, what their risks are going back, contact athlete, younger patients. We can measure this thing with a micrometer, but it's still getting us in the range of what we want to do. So we have to be careful about measuring the micrometer. We're still treating the patients, even though we have <clears throat> really good imaging now. So he went back to play and got through eh, three or four games. The brace hurt. Um, really went to the, turned to the athletic trainer, who's actually there. Uh, it's a darn that really hurt. Got a new MRI, and then uh, we all meet. Uh, these are some of the uh, images you can see here. And so here's an axle CT. It's a proton density, so not, not a fluid uh, sensitive sequence. But what I'm trying to look at is the front of that glenoid, which is at the top. And you can see the front of the glenoid looks a little bit eroded. Um, not too, too bad, but a little bit eroded. And then we look at the sagittal oblique here, and you can see that it's, you can see a little bit of a hill sax right here. Sorry about that. This is showing here. You can see that hill sax right there. And the hill sax really shows up. The hill sax lives almost at the top of the humeral head. You can, a, a hill sax that's important, you'll pick up within the first one to two axle cuts when the humeral head's in there. So as you're scrolling through these, you're gonna see that hill sacs pretty quickly. You can see a little bit of a divot there. And so when I see that, my next question is, how big is the glenoid bone loss? We gotta be smarter about this. When you see that, you can say, okay, I know for a fact he's got some level of glenoid bone loss. We just have to figure it out. And you can see the hill sacs there a little bit on the humerus as well. And then we look here in the sagittal oblique and you can see, you know, not too, too bad. We like to see that it's called the uh, pear. The, the, the glenoid is in the shape of a pear. We like to see that, um, but it's not too, too bad. And these are showing some of the measurements. Uh, feel free to look these up. But this is an example of a young patient. And look what's going on here. Look at the humeral head cartilage. It looks terrible um, on top of a huge hill sac. So on top of multiple recurrences. So when you get this cliff in the front, and it's easy to engage that hill sex. So that's engagement. That's when they dislocate. That's when you got to relocate them on the sidelines. But it just becomes easier and easier as you get bone loss on both sides. And these both compress. When we get our images, I just put this here for informational purposes. When you're looking at, we have to be careful about what we rely on. Information is key, but we have to be careful. This is a study we published when, hey, guess what? When we all sit in a CT scan or MRI, that glenoid sits off axis. And so you're taking cuts, axle cuts like this on the glenoid when we really need the cuts from 12 to six. This is what we get in a standard MRI because that's just how you're seeing the MRI. The tech you know, can correct it ahead of time. And so if you have a good tech and people that do this, you can, you can correct this ahead of time. And that's the cuts we want to see. We want to be perpendicular to the long axis of the glenoid. You can shift that and change that pre-processing, post-processing, but you have to be careful about what you see 
So generally why we say why, when I'm showing you that is that can lead you astray and that can be five, 10, 20% off just based on how the, how the cuts were taken in the CT scanner. Now what's exactly true is the 3D. And that's why we say 3D. The way they process the 3D versus a two-dimensional, which I just showed you, the three-dimensional CT is uh, top. That's the top. It's the gold standard because the way it's reconstructed is a true image of what we see. And you can see multiple different bone losses there. Well, our non-operative care is this patient right in our uh, right in our wheelhouse for what we see for numbers these days. Now, if you look at uh, Hovelius and it's a researcher out of Scandinavia, he's an outstanding researcher. He has a ton of uh, long-term instability, both latter J and stabilization procedures, non-operative cohorts. He's followed more, now more for the 20 plus years, 25 years. It's amazing. So he has this 227 patients for 27 year, 25 years, non-operative management of shoulder instability. 57% uh, of patients reported one or more recurrent dislocation, 35% reported dislocations, and 27% went on to have surgical stabilization. Now that number's probably a little bit low based on based on the age of the patient and some of their demands. So I'd, I'd be a little bit careful, but the reality is what you can tell, you can tell your patients is uh, anywhere from 70 to 90% are gonna have a recurrence. So anyway, uh, we're in here scoping this patient at this point. Uh, we calculated the bone loss right about, you know, this was this case was a while ago. So this was maybe eight so years ago. And so we're measuring this bone loss in the front of the shoulders to the right. So that's the anteriors to the right, posteriors to the left. So the probe's coming in from posterior. We're in the lateral decubitus, so the humerus is above us. And what we have is this alpsitere, we have bone loss, we have cartilage lesions, glad lesions. You're seeing all the stuff I just talked about. And why is that important? Because it can uh, have, an, have a relevance on our outcomes, meaning higher recurrence with arthroscopic stabilizations. But believe me, I still love an arthroscopic stabilization. They do very well. We need to do a good preparation. We like preparing the labrum. We like preparing the bone. We like making sure that we have this completely elevated, freed up. It's all liberated. There's a bunch of different devices to do this very well. And we want to preserve bone. If we lose another millimeter, it might be another three or four percent. All right, so we're high five in. We got a great repair. Um, looks great. Shoot a little extra video because you think it all looks great. And uh, five anchors, rehab for six months, scapular controls better than ever. We were all over this. Returns to duty at six months. High five in the OR. Remember that. He was lifting his dive gear overhead, put on the dive gear, significant subluxation. Actually, so much that he broke the regulator on his dive gear and got in trouble from the dive master. So, um, ended up with this. And so now you can see we have a bony bank heart. Uh, can't quite see the hill sacs. You can get a hint of the hill sacs on the humerus right there in the center. We don't have this internal rotation striker notch view is what it's called, but you can actually ask for an internal rotation striker notch view if you want to see the hill sacs a little bit better on x-ray. But what you can see here is on the anterior and this axillary view, this is almost a West Point axillary, but you can see that on the anterior part of the uh, glenoid, which is the top part of the socket there, you just see this, you don't see a nice cortical outline. And when you see that lack of cortical outline, you got to know there's bone loss. You can see all the anchors I put in. Now you can see a new bony bank art fragment. And I'm like, why did I high five after this case? And so here's what we've got now. A much bigger bone loss situation, probably in the 25, 20, 25% range. That bone fragment is not good quality. It's healed medially. Um, and so we look at this. And that case I did was probably about eight to 10 years ago. Uh, was this repair successful? I would say probably not. And got to critique, you know, what this patient was doing, what his high-risk activities. I probably would have treated him differently uh, with a with a primary surgery. And he got nine, twelve months out of it. That's not enough. So when when are these things successful? Scope repairs, less than two dislocations, less than six months of instability sim symptoms. And when you have that bipolar that's not huge, it doesn't engage like I showed you on that, that scope picture. But that scope video of that humorous engagement, when I saw that, I should have now, again, it's 10 years ago now, I would have bailed and gone to a different procedure. So you had a revision arthroscopic bank heart repair. I was actually deployed at the time. So my partner did this, uh, underwent super high-end rehab this time, way better. We're going to get this right. Instead of five anchors, we did six. Uh, returned at seven months, dislocated his first live combat to combat training event. So not only, you know, Navy diver, but do a lot of 
hands-on uh, combat stuff. So we talk about other things and other adjuncts. This was uh, actually done at the time, a remplissage, where we actually Tina a in uh, into the defect of the hill sacks. You actually put some anchors into that and actually try to pull the humeral head back. Uh, you can do reasonably well with this. 90% return in the sport, 70% same level of sport, uh, which is actually not too bad. It's a nice, uh, nice adjunct, uh, but it's not good for a thrower. And so if you're taking care of a throwing population, and usually I would put both uh, major league pitchers, college pitchers, maybe some infielders that are really having to whip it around, uh, female fast pitch softball, uh, we have not seen a good return. Non-thrower, 95%, thrower, 51%. So be careful about this rim passage where Tina D seen in the back of the rotator cuff into that hill sacks defect. Well, he gets another CT scan. And there he is now, the anchors, larger defect, much bigger. And we want to look at this, how much bone loss there is. A lot of times that bone is garbage in the front. You feel like it looks, oh, it'd be great. I could put some screws in it. Let's fix it. Let's put anchors. But we did a lot of studies on this. And a lot of the fragment was melted away. And the quality of it was very poor. And so when we looked at this with, you know, really an MRI, MRI and CT scan microscope, if you will, it really was not good. And a lot of them had significant attrition of the fragment, meaning 75% of that fragment just melted away. So if you have these bony lesions that have been around for a few months, it doesn't take long, even just a few months, they can go away and it's a big problem. So now we get a bigger hill sacks to deal with. We had more hill sacks, all the same patient. And so we opted for the open ladder day. And if we had probably done this first, which I had probably would have done now, no question, uh, I think this patient would have had one surgery. And so there's a cost to that. And there's no question. We have to we have to be better about this. It's hard. Um, these are very typical cases that are presented all the times at our meeting. And of course, we debate it uh, to no end. But at the end of the day, uh, this was probably the right uh, surgery for this patient. And so the open ladder J, the subscapularis, we, we, do a, we do an inline split. And so we don't take it down doing a ladder J. Why is that important? Because subscaps everything. We have to preserve it. Uh, it can help with the rehab. It helps with a lot of what we do. And so we split it. Uh, that, that top to bottom subscaps about five centimeters. So we split it about three above, two centimeters below. And there we are splitting that right there. And that's where we're going to sneak our ladder jet. Why do we not take the subscap down? Well, again, something else we can look at after surgery, counsel our patients on. It's a strength issue. And it's also less atrophy. You get better outcome scores if you don't take it down. So we really try to do that. It can be more challenging, especially in a larger, uh, big muscled uh, NFL player, for example, which I've done a lot of, quite a few ladder chase on, and uh, they're harder. We also have a lot of ways to harvest the coracoid. And so we're able to harvest this coracoid. You can see here, this is where we want to take it. It's about 22 to 28 millimeters of bone, depending on who you are. And that bone, we basically just cut and we transfer down to the front of the shoulder. So I've cut it here. What's attached to it is the conjoint tendon. So I got the conjoint tendon to the right of that, uh, uh, to the right of my finger there. That's a little bit bloody and that's the conjoint tendon. But now we're taking this down to good cancellous bone so we get good healing. And uh, we're going to pre-drill some holes with some commercial guides. And then we're going to be able to fix this piece of bone, which is literally uh, just under about one inch of bone. Clonoid exposure is super important. So we have to prepare this. A lot of times you got bone that's uh, just not, not ready to accept a transfer of another piece of bone. It's bad healing. Uh, it's all scarred in. So you have to prepare this with a lot of different tools, high-speed burrs, high-speed rasp. A lot of different ways to do this. I just want to show that there's the traditional and the congruent dark way. The congruent dark is actually very, very, very intuitive. Uh, Steve Burkhardt and Joe DeBeer. Joe DeBeer took care of uh, a ton of South African rugby players. Great surgeon. was able to rotate. Uh, came up with rotating the coracoid another 90 degrees so you get concavity to the surface. We fix it with a couple screws, one centimeter apart. We use a lag technique. And then there's a lot of ways, about 20 ways to do this. And we tie a capsule in, we can uh, use anchors, we can use sutures. And then here's another thing we have to be very careful of is a study we did after the after you take down that coracoid and that, that conjoint tendon protects the whole plexus and all the blood vessels and all the bad things you want to stay away from. So once you take that down, 
uh, it's kind of a naked plexus. That's what I call it. It's, uh, for lack of a better word, it's a problem there. So we got to be really careful. And it's super close. This is a study we did looking at the NFL combine players over about eight years. Um, there were 13 uh, latter days we identified. Almost half had uh, complications and, and chronic pain. Sixty uh, percent had near complete core cord resorption, and a number of players went undrafted. So this is, you know, we have to be careful of this. We have to be careful of the technique. Uh, we have to really make sure it's necessary. And someone that's maybe running 20, 22 miles an hour and, you know, getting popped really quick. And that conjoint tendon, you know, has a lot of stress across the screws. You know, we do have really good outcomes with Latterge, but it's not perfect. It's not perfect as many places in the world would say, France specifically. Uh, well, we only have 2% failure, we have 1% failure. I haven't seen that uh, in, in the literature. And if you really scrutinize the literature, it's anywhere from about 4%, 5% to maybe 11 to up to 15% of recurrence or the shoulder just doesn't feel right. But it's done, it's done very well. This was actually an NFL player that had a huge coracoid. I used three screws in this patient. And you can see you get huge, nice restoration. This patient had about 35 or 40%, uh, but we opted for him to have a, have that type of graft. Um, I'm not sure why that's repeating. I'm sorry about that. Um, so anyway, we were able to transfer that down. What's nice about it is we are able to get the patients back by about four to five months and have a really good solid uh, rehab program working on scapula, scapula stabilization. And that patient that I just showed you in the case, you know, I have to be very diligent for this person because they've had numerous procedures, numerous insults to their sole shoulder. But sometimes latter days fail, uh, recurrence, pain, instability. So anytime you're evaluating a musculoskeletal injury in a patient or an outcome or your intervention, <clears throat> it's like, okay, the shoulder dislocates. That's all we're focused on. Well, that's not all you can fail for. You can also fail for pain. Hey, if your shoulder hurts after and you're doing well and your outcomes aren't good, uh, or if you have stiffness or weakness, I go, oh, it's great. My shoulder feels stable now, but now I'm really weak. So we talk about nerve injuries or muscle problems, pain, you know, complications of hardware. You can have uh, arthritis, GLAD lesions that turn into arthritis at 10 to 20 years. Um, and then we get down to recurrence. Recurrence is the last thing I want to, I want to rule out these other things, pain, weakness, stiffness, as being a cause for their poor outcome score. With that, I just want to touch on this for a second. So these are all either cases of mine or cases that were sent in to me. And you can see these are challenging ones. You got bent screws, you got broken ladder shades, you got all kinds of problems. You can imagine this is a joint that's just not, not doing well. And so basically uh, back in about 2000, uh, 2005 or six, I said, well, let's restore this. Let's restore the bone. Let's restore the cartilage. And I asked the graft companies for fresh glenoids. Very hard to get from graft companies. There's donor concerns. There's higher contamination rates. So I said, well, what don't you use? This is why you just have to ask questions. I said, well, we process a lot of talus, you know, the ankle joint for our foot and ankle surgeons to put in talus cartilage, but we throw away all the distal tibias. I was like, distal tibia, it's concave. Send me the distal tibia. So sent a bunch out to my lab at Balboa in San Diego and this is an unmatched person. This is uh, two different male patients. And you can see just how well the body's conserved uh, when we were developed uh, as humans. It's amazing. There's a, there's a law of nature about this with radius of curvature and other things. But we have options now that I think are very nice with these free bone grafts and fresh distal tibia graft. And here you can see some of our work on this where <clears throat> we're able to get some very reliable healing after some very challenging cases. These are all distal tibias that have healed in. Uh, with overall, you know, very, very good results. So with that, I, I just want to touch briefly on a, on a knee case. There's a lot, there's a lot to go over here, obviously, but <clears throat> I want to talk about a patient that had an ACL reconstruction. He was a U.S. ski team racer. Um, he was unable to return to racing due to instability and pain. And he couldn't progress through his rehab. <clears throat> you could stick this uh, type of case to uh, any male or female in the military, in public safety, uh, in the police force, et cetera. Uh, you, need, you need a stable knee for a lot of these jobs that you're all uh, take care of these folks that are doing. Uh, ACL bracing on loader uh, was used, it helped, but it was still a big problem. Had a lot of anterior translation and uh, laxity both of ACL and some of the other ligamentous structures. These are some of the things these folks do. and. Um, it's one of his videos, actually. 
you can see these skis are about 200, 210 centimeters long, and they just act as significant lever arms for the knee to cause just an incredible amount of torque and force. And a lot of times we'll see MCLs, ACLs, ACLs, LCLs. <clears throat> but he, again, just like the shoulder, pain, instability, stiffness, weakness. Why was he not doing well with his ACL? Well, here's what's very interesting. I wanted to point this out. So he had a lot of pain when he went skiing. <clears throat> tried to run the gates. What's in the gates? There's a lot of, uh, you, you know the sport, don't know, there's a lot of ruts that develop. And so you're going around a gate at 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, and you're trying to keep the knee, the knee stable, your lower body stable, but it's did, 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 huge chatter as you come around, come around these corners. So he actually, because his knee was unstable and so unstable, he developed stress fractures. So look at these stress fractures on this knee here. It's unbelievable. So he had femoral stress fractures, tibia stress fractures, mm -hmm. both sides. I, I could add a ton more yellow arrows there. You can see all the stress injuries. Those are real. So don't don't miss those on an MRI. Sometimes the radiologists are usually pretty good about finding them, but we, we can be even better, especially when you have the exam. Stress fractures are huge. We see a ton of these in the military. I know all of you have uh, helped us pioneer on how we treat these and how we come up with better protocols so we don't get the new recruit stress fractures this has been a huge part of my life at Balboa in San Diego with the Marine Corps Recruit Depot, uh, with the SEAL teams, Don Kessler working on things to make sure that we don't have this happen because once it happens, it's a bad, vicious cycle. And so there's a lot of kinematic work we need to do. Uh, we need to look at uh, torques, uh, load rate, free movement, uh, looking at the whole lower extremity, PKIP adduction, there's a gazillion things here and beyond the scope of this, but it's sometimes we have to even go to surgery for you know tibial nail and other things uh, to get this done. Uh, I do, I'm a big believer in medications that are uh, bone uh, pro remodeling anabolic agents. Uh, this continuous renewal helps me maintain mechanical strength. Um, there is the one thing everyone is concerned about, a very, very extremely rare warning of uh, sarcoma, or soft tissue sarcoma or cancer, if you will, from using a medication like this. But uh, there's been now numerous, numerous, numerous studies that have shown that that just doesn't happen with 50,000 type of patients. So this is a really good medication. We use it on top of everything else. We do like this support and, you know, just for, you know, an, an OSER, plug this is something I, I use all the time depending on their on their uh what they're doing um this thing fits a lot very well under the uniform and i love the rebound cartilage you can dial this in for varus valgus you can even get some anterior posterior uh stability at least from a proprioception standpoint in it but this three-point leverage system is really good it's called rebound cartilage and really was you know for unloading cartilage defects or meniscus insufficiency but we've also extrapolated it for mcls lcls and other other type of ligament injuries we do know there's reduced compartment force during this walking so th this one just fits really well and, and something we use uh I like these uh, knobs and our patients like the knobs that they can take on and off. And this is actually something that doesn't end up in the closet when our patients come back. They actually wear it and it, it comes back pretty beat up. And so it's been one of the ones I've I've tended to use when we're dealing with patients to try to get them back non-operatively or after surgery to help them help them do a little bit better. And obviously in this case, a custom ACL, a CTI type of brace was also used. So this is what we had used, this uh, ACL failure, graft complications, tunnel issues, restraints, other ligamentous injuries. Uh, the meniscus is very important. So if you lose meniscus, guess what? You increase your load, but you also lose stability. Uh, we can get less osteoarthritis. So there's a huge push now to try to preserve the meniscus as much as possible. MCL classification, this is all, <clears throat> I find this very interesting. It's actually, uh, uh, it, actually, one of our medical associations, one of the only ones that has an orthopedic classification. And so this MRI classification is the MRI one. It's not the AMA one, but it shows you know minor to severe to complete disruption. And why do we get antsy about this? Because combined MCL and ACL happen all the time. And the MCL, if it's bad, can and you don't if you don't address it, uh, whether it's by healing or with surgery, you can lead to early ACL reconstruction failure. The other thing we look at is the dark side of the knee. Uh, my old partner, Rob LaProd, was just absolutely phenomenal at uncovering all of this. Just did a great job looking at the lateral side, which is inherently uh, unstable, and it just does not heal uh, well. Once it's stretched out, it has a huge problem, especially on the lateral side. It's not heal like the MCL. The lateral side does not heal like the medial side. And so once you get 
uh, once you get this LCL stretch, it's like it's like a bungee cord and it just doesn't come back. So that's a huge problem. Uh, here's a posterior lateral drawer test with a posterior lateral. You can see a lot of increased external rotation, especially at between 70 and 90 degrees. Uh, you can see some of these combined injuries. And why do we miss so many of these? Well, because MRI undercalls them. And here for me, when I see this now, that's an LCL injury. But many times this will be undercalled or not even called. Now you can see the LCL on MRI. So guess what? We have to examine the patient. So we go back to an exam, we go back to their side to side difference. We test the LCL at zero and 30 degrees and check a side to side difference. We can use one of those braces like rebound cartilage or uh, even extrapolate an unloader, a medial unloader to help stabilize the lateral side if you have a symptomatic lateral deficiency or even up to a uh, ACL brace. And this is a ACL dynamic brace, which has actually been using quite a bit. It's the first dynamic brace on the market that actually has, you can see right above the hinge, there's a wire and that wire is pretty cool. Uh, you know, in full disclosure, my, my partner Rob LaProd uh, worked on it um, and we actually, uh, I've worked on it here in the lab some uh, in Vail, Colorado, but it's super cool. It's like the, the PCL brace is very similar to this, but it actually has dynamics. So as you uh, extend, it keeps, uh, it helps load the knee appropriately like we would want to prevent some ACL strain. Long limb alignment, super important. So we always get hip to ankle on our patients to see where they're at. And so now we let his stress fractures calm down a little bit. Got him on Forteo, that skier. You can see all these have healed. There's still a little bit of edema there as you go through on that fluid sensitive sequence, but it's getting a lot better. Uh, the pain's better. We also shut him down from skiing. You can still see the stress injuries in there. It's, it's amazing what this, uh, what this racer had. And uh, we also get a CT scan, especially for prior tunnels. We almost always get on our patients uh, post ACL. Just look at our tunnels. Here I'm showing you after I bone grafted it. So he got a stage procedure where I bone grafted the tibial tunnel, took out his hardware, and we just like getting a CT scan around, you know, around three to four months to make sure that's consolidated enough. Fortunately, uh, I had a BTB left for him, and I love BTB for some of our high end athletes. I just keep coming back to it. There's a lot of graft choices out there uh, hamstring, quad tendon, BTB, allograft. Um, there are a lot of pros and cons, and that's a whole talk in and of itself. But fortunately for this one, I, I just get the most stability and with super good rehab, with good patellar mobilization. Dick Stedman, our uh, founder here at the Seven Clinic in Vail, published a great study looking at amount. If you had near symmetrical patellar mobility, especially through the patella, through the patellar tendon, after BTB, uh, you basically had no anterior knee pain. So, you know, this is this is something we have to work on postoperatively. Sometimes their DNA takes over, they form a lot of scars, so you have to work on that. But the better patellar mobility, the less knee pain. And so we're able to uh, revise this. We have to manage a lot of angles based on where prior tunnels were. So that's what we're looking at there. We have to make sure we get good bony tunnels. We're able to put this graft in and uh, you know really get a, a nice, nice positioning of the graft. Um, we like the graft posterior for the most part. We keep about a two to three millimeter back wall, which Freddie Fu and so many others have taught us, especially with double bundle, but uh, we don't do a lot of double bundle these days, I would say, for the most part, but a really nicely done single bundle. Now with our outside in or inside out techniques, gets this femoral tunnel really where we want it. And it's just, it's much better than what we've been able to do with the trans tibial. Now we don't want it too low. Can't have it too low down that thermal notch. We want it just in the right spot. <laughs> so we're always looking, we're always critiquing. You got to critique your x-rays after and feel and KT 1000 and test it. Um, Etc. The last thing here, let me see, is this play? No, it doesn't shoot. So the last thing here was the uh, lateral collateral ligament reconstruction, where we actually reconstruct the lateral collateral ligament on top of doing the BTD, which uh, which is patient needed. I'm going to show Mark. So I got one more, like five, six slides of a pretty cool case. Um, yeah, go ahead. I think everybody's. Oh, you want me to take some? Yeah, you want me to take some questions? Okay, this is yeah, this is a 35 year old uh, rated dominant female. This is uh, basically a picture of her hauling hauling tail down down the bike trail. Uh, she fell, landed on her arm, uh, taking the R out of closed reduction. So what's the problem with this? She went out the back posteriorly. Bad, bad, bad problem. Actually, just a plug. This is the number one uh, 
shoulder, knee, ankle, everything. This is the number one closed legal litigious claim that's closed, meaning uh, against the hospital, against the physician, et cetera, because this is missed. And the reason it's missed is they are comfortable in a sling and internal rotation. So you gotta get the axillary view. Um, I may have waited to reduce it if you could, but they couldn't reduce it in the ER, but they did get a CT scan to confirm it. And there it is here. And so this is what we call a huge reverse hill sac. So you can see that hill sac is on the other side of the humeral head, it's anterior. And the problem with this, the reason I wanna show this is that's all cartilage. And first of all, we don't wanna miss a posterior dislocation. Get an axillary, get an exam. Problem is they're super comfortable in the sling. So always be careful that you gotta get the image in, gotta examine them. A lot of times if you pull them out, they'll they'll lock and they'll, they'll pull their whole body over because they're locked on the scapula. So an exam can even can pick up that lock dislocation. Don't miss it. Um, and so now we got about the problem with this is reverse hill sacs, all cartilage. I think hill sacs and reverse hill sacs should be renamed because reverse hill sacs completely different. It's all cartilage and it's a big problem. It was a ton of your 180 degree congruity or joint. And so basically what we did is we Look at that huge uh, reverse hill sac. So we're sort of scoping this. Uh, I repaired the labrum posteriorly in the back, but you can see all that cartilage damage in the humeral head anteriorly. Uh, we had a posterior labral repair. Um, and then we have this ruler uh, to prepare a graft. And then we use the uh, talus and a fresh, this is where we came up, he said if the uh, distal tibia fits, then why can't I use some of the products the foot and ankle surgeons use? which is used in the uh, fresh talus, uh, and this up to about 40 millimeters in an on-sized manner. I can get these very quickly. We do a lot of wood shop 401, but we're able to, again, how the body's amazingly conserved in this radius curve, which we're able to put that back. And there you can see what we reconstructed with these headless screws, put the graft in. And you can see, you know, we gave this patient, I think, a fighting chance to reconstruct the joint, centered up, and did very well. Hopefully you don't, in the summer, you don't have too many cold days in Foxborough. We know these are coming. I hope these are coming for us all um, for sports coming soon. But with that, Marge, I want to thank you. Thank you all for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thanks Great. so much. Please, um, thank you, Dr. Preventure. That was awesome. Please uh, post your messages in the chat portion. And while we're waiting for those to fill in, um, Don and Nancy and also Dr. Preventure on that. So what overall are the unique do you see unique challenges in dealing with these really high demanding athletes from, from treatment to rehab? And um, Don, I'll turn it over to you and give Dr. Provincia a break. And your work with this, like, what are the, you know, what are the things that just, you, you wanna say to your fellow athletic trainers, you know, this is, this is what it's about. <laughs> um, well, Dr. Provincia has already kind of hinted on it. Um, and one of the things that we've said uh, with the SEALs, uh, we would like to have as our motto, something that they don't claim, but our motto to say, they try to say, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. So, you know, if you said, hey, we want you to run five miles this week, they'll run 100 miles. If you said, I want you to do 10 repetitions, they'll do 100 repetitions. And so that's, you know, constantly their mindset. And so what we've seen with this is, uh, as he alluded to, stress fractures. It's a huge, huge thing that goes. I have started um, about five years ago just being in charge of stress fractures and trying to get them back and not re-injured and yet still able to do anything. And um, I have seen over 275 stress fractures of tib, fib, femur, whatever it may be, 275. And so... I've been doing this for 49 years and work with track and everything else. And you probably could add up all my years and not see that many stress fractures as I've seen recently. And, you know, now when we look at high school and college sports, and again, Dr. Provencia alluded to it about how they overuse everything, even the little kids that are doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, we see these stress fractures. With football, out of season training, they're running 300 pounders on AstroTurf, you know, multiple sprints and things. And so we see stress fractures in football. You never saw that before. So that is, you know, something common with all sports. And we see more than anybody because everybody's running in boots and long pants and they're running six to 10 miles a day. Um, and there's nothing you do about as far as uh, we'll cut your mileage, uh, we'll change your surface, we'll change your shoes. There isn't anything we could do about it. So. One of the things that I did, and I've actually been going around the country speaking at 
District 1, District 2, District 7, District 8, CATA, uh, I spoke at the NATA last year in a learning lab, is I have found through working with Nike um, and more than that, uh, the Oregon project uh, with distance runners that they've folded now, but learned that um, something I never knew, and again, I run tremendous amount uh, and have been running for 60 years, um, that technique is so important. And as we find with any sport, whether it was rowing and Dr. Preventure, if you had a lousy rowing technique, you screwed up your back, right? We found that with many, many, many people, their running technique is terrible. And what I found out most, more than anything else, were a couple of cases with us that were tremendous athletes. One was an Olympic gold medal swimmer, um, had bilateral stress fractures, had another um, ice hockey player from Brown University, bilateral stress fractures, tibia. And I watched them run, and you wanted to say right then, stop. I mean, they look like Doberman puppies trying, you know, all over the place. <laughs> and my whole goal was to try to make them faster. And just as if you saw somebody who was a poor swimmer and you gave him an extra two hours a week to swim, but never showed him any techniques, they never got any better. So we started working on techniques that I learned through Nike and they got better, faster. And then over a period of time, I started to see that these guys had less stress fractures. They did had less reoccurrence. And we know that with stress fractures, with all the track and cross country kids you have, if a kid has had a stress fracture, he probably has a 50% chance of having another one. And what I did over these five years and working on technique and come up with a program that I call Faster, you can find it on YouTube, Don Kessler Faster, is work on six points of their running technique. And we cut down their re-injury for stress fractures down to 3%. Wow. Um, 50% to 3%. And it really was technique. And it goes back to my days working at Princeton under Dick Malacray and, and um, looking at whatever sport you're covering in an athletic trainer is watch the technique that they're doing. Listen to the coach talking about technique. I went out in the, in the, in the boat with a coach in the 2004 Olympics in our training and watch technique of the rowers, hear the coach say things about them and know that some of these kids had problems that I was treating, not from, necessary an injury, but lousy technique, worked on their technique, did things to make their strength better and make sure they did technique better and better. So, you know, stress fractures, I'd say, hey, most of the stuff we see is is um, lower body and it's uh, running. And I'm and I know from watching, you know, most of those people have terrible technique. No one teaches people how to run. I watched my grandson run as a six year old and he looks like a penguin, arms by his side going over. And who knows how they got to be better? No one's taught them. And those are things that can be done and can help out in a, in a situation. You can help kids. And like I said, these guys are 22, 25, whatever it may be. It takes a few weeks to get it, but they learn it and they keep it. I've had guys, again, come back who now are on SEAL Team 6 and everything else and just say, I've had no problems. I love running, doing it just because they're working on their technique. So. Great comments, Don. And that goes back to our training and athletic training with biomechanics, really absolutely. assessing the biomechanics, because what you just said is absolutely tried and true over all of time. Fix the technique, eliminate a lot of the overuse issues. So I'll call on Nancy in a minute, but we have a couple questions, Dr. Provincher. Um, here's one from Heidi. On the recurrent dislocator, what is the long-term risk of OA and destabilization surgery alter this risk? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. So we we have good evidence that OA develops with or without surgery. Um, so you look at all arthroscopic bank cards followed for 20, 25 years, you get arthritis no matter what. Fortunately, it's not terrible. We don't walk on our shoulders. Uh, most people can live with it, but many go on to some other replacements, resurfacings, et cetera, 20, 25, 30 years down the road. So that's, that's a risk I always put down there. Of course, the 18-year-old that wants nothing to do with that or hear about any of that it goes over their head, but it's, it's real and we're all thinking about that. So I, I, think that's, I think that's important. Can we alter the natural history? I want to believe so with a well-done case. We do have some early evidence that shows with well-done stabilization, well-done rehab, no major recurrences, that you can lessen that arthritis risk, but it's early evidence at this point. 
Great, thank you. And another question uh, from James. Based off of your case presentation, would you recommend starting with Latterge rather than bony bank heart with recurrent dislocations in special op populations? Yeah, great, <clears throat> great, great question. One, one of the things I would lose sleep about every night when treating uh, folks, Don or others would send to me, Vinny, I see you on there, thanks for joining. Others would send me, Jason Jag too, many, I mean, Mark Rogo, so many great folks. Um, everything I learned uh, on this was more stable is better for these folks because I would lose sleep about uh, what they were doing uh, at night, clandestine operations, shoulders in tough positions, jumping out of perfectly good airplanes with you know, the arm up like this at the first, you know, first position at 28,000 feet with a halo drop, you know, it's a real deal. So I, I, I lost sleep over this and I got more aggressive. Uh, that's why I showed that case um, on the Navy diver. So this would be one I would certainly think about for a special operator that has, if it's not pristine, if you don't get to it with those factors, you don't get to it right away, in a couple months. You don't get to it before multiple recurrences and the tissue and bone doesn't look pristine. That's arthroscopic and that type of high, high end consequence and contact athlete. Um, if I had done a bony bank heart, meaning an open bank heart, I think that that patient, that Navy diver would have been fine uh, or ladder chain. And so a lower threshold to do an open bank heart. Uh, it's also just like a wrestler. Wrestler's job is to dislocate the other wrestler's shoulder. That's an open bank. I don't even talk about it. Scopic. It's an open bank heart until it's a, until as long as there's no big big bone loss. It's an open bank heart to start with out the gate, and it probably should be for our high end uh, special forces and certain other folks that just have consequence. I call it you know they're consequence athletes. Great. Thank you, Dr. Preventure. Nancy, so in the athletes that you've dealt with and developed programs for. Um, uh, overall like challenges that you had with all of the things that um, your your public service um, athletes perform? Um, well, hello everyone. Um, and uh, Dr. Preventer, thank you very much. Um, uh, your questions, this that previous question, um, ha my mind is just running. So first of all, I'd like to say the public safety population has to be very similar to the military, have to be operationally ready to respond at a moment's notice. And that means that we, as athletic trainers, we have to have our people, we can't worry that if somebody is going to jump off the truck when they arrive at a fire, that their knee's gonna give out um, because they landed improperly. We, we, we can't have that. We can't have an officer going, especially in this day and age, going to an event where they have to go um, safely hands-on with somebody and we have to worry about how they recovered from a, um, um, a shoulder procedure or surgery. So we, we have to make sure that they're ready to go. The other thing is um, it's a little different than the military because these are folks who are earning a living in public safety. So if they're injured on the job, then you have workers' compensation in the mix. And we, we wanna make sure that whatever we do puts them in a position that they're able to be functionally ready to go safely and not have a re-injury because then you're affecting that person's job, you're affecting their retirement, you're affecting their overtime, and uh, you could be affecting them legally um, with, um, different uh, things that can happen um, with uh, questioning care. Um, with our population, it's age 21 to 60 plus. And typically once our uh, men and women are in their mid thirties, that's when we start seeing the falling apart of the uh, shoulder joint, and the knee joint because of previous history. Some may have had a previous um, history of dislocation, surgery, um, ACL uh, tear, or ACL injury that was never fully addressed. And at this point, what we're looking to do is to do what's best for that particular um, officer, whether it's firefighter or police officer. And uh, we did have um, quite an occasion for a lot of our surgeons when I first was starting with um, public safety to be very conservative in their care. 
And that's one of the things I was really interested in what you're saying, Dr. Poventure, was about we need to be a little more aggressive in caring for these unstable joints, the shoulder instability especially, that we can't brace them in public safety, that workers' comp will not allow a brace because they're not fully functional. If the brace fails, then the injury could be even worse. So I, I fully, fully agree with what you said about getting, getting that patient quickly, getting a, a, an assessment, making the decision to, um, to uh, uh, fix them, if you will, bring them functionally back to, to operation. Um, we brought our surgeons in to training academies and put them in on ride along so they could actually see how people were functioning. And it did chain some of them on, the thing is sometimes, everybody gets excited when they see somebody in their medical office that has a badge. It's like, tell me stories about your job. It's like, no, no, I'm here to be fixed. <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not here by the job. You need to fix them. And um, so we did find uh, much better compliance with a lot of our physicians in being more uh, strictly attuned to what they, the job requirements were for these people and being a little more aggressive in their care to do repairs, especially especially with uh, some of these, um, these uh, previous, previous histories of the athletes. Um, let's see, the running technique, oh my gosh, Don, I, I watched at the academy, I would go in every new class, and just as I did when I was in the school system, at the beginning of every sport, and watch these new people come in, and it just makes you want to cry. <laughs> They're just so sad, and, and you're right. Um, so quickly, we were able to uh, get even we even videoed some of them and put them through a training and, and showed them the video and gave them techniques on improving their abilities to run, walk, jump, hop, leap, and and that was helpful. And then working on their foot stability with certain inserts and better shoes and better boots and 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 that was that was helpful. Um, I've often thought that it would be really nice before we hire anybody in fire and rescue or law enforcement to put them through an N NFL combine style physical assessment. I know because you get people that they don't really, it's not that they're lying. They just avoid telling you they dislocated their shoulder playing football seven years ago. And then the second week in the academy, they have another complete dislocation. And, um, and then that, now, they're, now they're gone. If we'd known that ahead of time, we may have been able to do some pre prehabbing or some more specific work with them to prevent that from happening in the beginning. Um, let's see. Um, so just a couple things on the OSER equipment that we used. Um, we would uh, hand out, uh, penny, if, if the office was fit to go and functional, but need a little something else for ankle stability, we'd give them a, um, an ankle brace, very similar to the um, uh, la the lace-up ankle brace that uh, Osher has, very similar to the ASO. Um, I would buy those and we would give them to them. Uh, we never gave them any knee braces because they needed to be specifically fit and measured, but we did have a couple of our uh, officers who were uh, working in um, at, at a desk they're, they were detectives. We did have some of them in the unloader brace. They were runners and they want to continue run at rest, running, but they had a maybe more of a lateral osteoarthritis happening in their, their knee. So the unloader was very, very helpful to them. Um, the other thing we found, um, I, I'm a fan of cooling units for specific things, more for pain control and anything because our folks never like to take pain medication. Um, and I, yeah. So uh, we used, uh, I would get a group of the cooling units, uh, the very simple ones. I think yours is the, the Cold Rush Compact. And we would just loan them out to them. And they were always very appreciative of them and they were more compliant with using that. And then they're, they're more compliant then with actually doing their rehab uh, back in the clinic. Um, but this is, this, is a, this is a wonderful presentation. And I do agree so much with get to the problem, fix the problem, rehab them to get them back to work rather than trying to say, well, let's see how you are in six months because you're just delaying the inevitable and you're making my job harder and you're stressing out the officer and their commanders. Um, 
we had one interesting thing. I was in, um, where was I? Um, um, out in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, we were looking at their fire department and they had a, a young man coming in to apply as a recruit and they had to go through a fitness performance test. And one of the things they had to do was they had a pike, which is a big long metal thing. And they had to push up on a piece of metal and then they had to come back, and then they had to change direction and uh, push down on a, a pole, a heavy kind of pendulum thing. So he grabbed the pike and he would jump up in the air and then come down. And after the second coming up and down, um, I turned to the uh, to the uh, gentleman administering the test and I said, watch his left knee. And so he said, well, what's wrong with it? I said, he's, he's going to blow out his ACL if you keep him doing that because he was so badly internally rotating and he had enough quad strength to hold him. I said, if you hire him, you're gonna have to have somebody work with him on uh, mechanics and strength and also put some, you know, work on his, uh, uh, get, him, get him more stable in his shoes. So that's where we can be really helpful is seeing people pre-job, watching them when they're training, trying to prevent a lot of these issues. And then once they become a surgical case, how can we work with a physician in, um, uh, you know, assisting with whatever we can do pre-surgery. I like to watch the surgery myself, see exactly what's being done because it's so helpful later on when I'm doing the rehab. And then um, I like to use so some some bracing, some mechanical devices post-surgery, but not sending them back to full duty in those devices because that's not it's not allowed with the workers' compensation laws, and and shouldn't be because you want them to rely on something that's uh, they're not fully comfortable with. Well, that's probably enough. That's awesome. That, that is just <laughs> awesome. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Can't say so, it. Can't say yeah, it any really. better. So good. And then, so you, you're saying the same, like the, the, the surgery has to be more aggressive. Your prevention has to be more aggressive. So that would hold true for the rehab too, right? I mean, yes. these people yeah, want to I mean, get back. So yeah. you're like, you're on it. Start them early. Start them yep. early. Um, yeah, that's, um, and, and I had a little scope uh, a few years ago by one of, uh, one of the uh, um, graduates from uh, the Sedman Clinic, great guy, and, um, and he, said two, he said, two days later, I want you on the bike. It's like, not a problem. Well, then I realized why my patients had problem getting on a bike. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> doing a full rotation two days after a a menisectomy is, is it not fun, but you got to do it. But um, yeah, get them in, get aggressive within certain norms, you know, within certain limits um, and do frequent rehab. You know, this, this seeing them once or twice a week in a clinic isn't enough. They need to be, yeah. if you can get them two, three, four, five days a week, if you can. And the home program, they should have an aggressive home program. And Don, certainly the same with, with your athletes, right? You're, you see them every day. Yeah. Uh, Basically, with the guys I'm working with, they're required to be there. So it's uh, very much like a college setting for the, the young buds guys that they are assigned to be rehabbed and they have to be there. So uh, it it's a little bit different with uh, Vinny uh, talking uh, on here or being on here and stuff, whereas the operators that you you can encourage, and it's like the firefighters and everybody else. Uh, I can remember working with Joe Hannafin, um, yeah out of um, New York City when we I worked with the US uh, Olympic rowing team and she talked about, you know, she'd see the patient, uh, you know, want a post-op visit and having a sling and stuff. And next time she'd see him, he'd be out of the sling and doing stuff. And she goes, what are you doing? Kind of like, hey, I got to get back with my guys, you know, and that's the way they are. So with our yeah. guys, we're allowed to control the bud students, but the rest of the time, you know, you try to encourage and make them make educated things. But as I said before, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. In their mind. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about rehab. So they can go clear the other way and yeah. um, do too much too soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. you have to know when to pull the plug on them and hold them back um, because they have that warrior attitude, you know. They're going to go full bore to the task and, and you don't want them to set themselves back. But uh, we, we know how to do that as ATs. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Dr. Provincher had to go back into he surgery, so um, yeah, he is. Yeah. Um, he's not I available anymore. But does anybody have a, uh, additional questions for um, 
for our panelists thank tonight. You all. You know, yeah, I, I, I have yeah, to say thank that. You all. Thanks, Margie. Oh, Appreciate thank it. You, thank Dr. you all. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. Um, this was a program that we were putting on uh, live last week if we were all in Atlanta together. And one of the silver linings of um, COVID is that virtually, you know, we can reach uh, 95 people rather than 25 people when everybody's really busy with everything else um, during the annual meeting. So although we miss that personal contact, and uh, I certainly do with my close colleagues on the call, um, there's some good things that are coming out of that. And, and, and one of them is having the opportunity to um, get to have all of you on this call, on this webinar, and have you um, uh, have a great presentation from Dr. Provincher and, and from uh, input from Don and, and Nancy. And so, so thank you all. Any final comments? Um, we're a little over. Um, this will be recorded and um, I'll send it um, to you, uh, Don and Nancy. And then uh, if any attendee would like it, please just email me. And again, uh, you'll get your certificates tomorrow uh, to submit for your BOC, well, one credit. Thank you for being athletic trainers. Thank you for your commitment to your athletes, your demanding athletes, which are a whole different breed and uh, appreciate all that you do for furthering athletic trainers and their career in these really important practice settings that you're in. Don and Nancy, an honor to be with you tonight. Thanks, thanks for the invite. Thanks Great. for the invite. Thank you all for being here.